Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Martucci, and I'm the Faculty Senate Chair for this academic year. I'm going to take off my mask when I'm up here speaking. Everyone in the community around me is wearing their mask, and we're all socially distanced. I hereby call the 2021 meeting of the Faculty Assembly to order. Welcome to all our honored and elected officials and those who are attending remotely. According to the faculty constitution, the university assembly shall include those faculty employed full time by West Virginia University, those who report to an academic dean, and those who perform activities responsive to the academic obligation of the university. The university assembly holds one regular meeting during each academic year, at which time the president shall report in detail on the state of the university. Following the president's report, there will be an opportunity for questions and comments. After the president and the question and answer time has concluded, there will be a brief break after which the faculty senate will convene for a meeting. There will be a separate Zoom link that will be shared prior to the break. At this time, please join me in welcoming the president of West Virginia University, Dr. E. Gordon Gee. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate that. And it's, uh, it's uh, a beautiful day out there, a little cool, but uh, obviously uh, follows upon us, which is, by the way, to our guests, is one of the most beautiful times in West Virginia, but one of the most beautiful times in this country. So it has been a year. I can't believe it. It's been uh, since a year I, uh, I addressed you just exactly one year ago. We, of course, have all lived through some very challenging times as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, continued to turn our university and our world upside down. I'm proud of how our community has responded. We are at above 80% vaccination rates for our faculty, staff, and students, and our numbers of COVID cases have continued to be very modest this semester. All this proves that the vigorous efforts we have taken to combat the virus have been effective and is also a tribute to the efficacy of the vaccine, uh, the vaccines themselves. The challenge we have faced from the virus have also given us a unique opportunity for reinvention and reimagination. Victor Hugo once wrote, emergencies have always been necessary to progress. It was darkness which produced the lamp. It was fog that produced the compass. It was hunger that drove us to exploration. From our current crisis, we have learned anew how vital higher education is for saving lives and generating opportunities. We have also learned how fragile higher education is in a divided country whose conflicts replicate on campus grounds and in a challenging financial climate and sometime, uh, that sometimes pits our aspirations against our resources. And we have learned just how precious health is, the physical and mental health of all people as well as the health of our social fabric, fabric and how much work it takes to maintain it. We learned these lessons and persevered through this pandemic by leaning on our Mountaineer values and the three pillars that support us every day, education, health care, and prosperity. We are supporting education in West Virginia by working to reverse an alarming trend. College-going rates are declining at a time when post-secondary education is more important than ever to financial and career stability. In our College of Education and Human Services, the Mountaineer Mathematics Master's Teacher Program is supporting our state's best secondary mathematics teachers and leveraging these teachers as leaders. We are also in enhancing our services for our first-generation students who face unique challenges. WVU First Gen, an initiative housed in the Office of Student Success, earned membership in the First Scholars Network, which includes more than 45 higher education institutions nationwide. First Scholars and WVU First Gen will work together to improve the overall campus experience for these students inside and outside of the classroom. And because a four-year degree is not always needed to achieve one's goals, we have also partnered with building trades organizations to create an apprenticeship pathways program. 
Students completing their apprenticeship training as carpenters also earn an associate's degree from WVU Potomac State College. We hope to develop craft-specific degree majors for all registered apprenticeship programs affiliated with the West Virginia State Building and Construction Trades Council. In healthcare, we open new frontiers to combat our state's biggest health threats. For example, the WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute launched a first in the US clinical trial using deep brain stimulation for treatment-resistant opioid use disorder. This is an important step toward, uh, this is an important step forward, let me just add, in our ongoing battle against this devastating epidemic in West Virginia, which leads the nation, as we know, in drug overdose deaths involving opioids. I had the privilege of speaking with a young man who was among the first to receive this treatment. For 18 years, he had battled drug addiction. Each time he attempted to overcome the habit, he had slipped back into addiction even worse than before. Now, after receiving this new treatment, he has been drug-free for two years. To hear his story is to realize that we are not just conducting research, we are applying that research to people's lives, and it is making an enormous difference. This summer, RNI also became the first provider in the region and among the first in the United States to use deep brain stimulation. Uh, which helps to improve the treatment of Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Our university is also leading the way in early cancer detection and treatment. The WVU Cancer Institute recently unveiled Lucas, a fully mobile unit that will traverse West Virginia providing lung cancer screening in rural areas. It, by the way, is the first of its kind in the nation. Our healthcare leaders have also worked hard to help West Virginia handle the pandemic and roll out vaccines. I'm grateful to Dr. Clay Marsh, Vice President and Executive Dean for Health Sciences, Albert Wright, the President and CEO of the WVU Health System, Jim Hoyer, Vice President for Startup West Virginia, who leads the Governor's Joint Interagency Task Force on Pandemic Response, and every single healthcare provider who has worked to save lives and protect public health throughout this state. Advancing prosperity. Advancing prosperity in West Virginia means helping the state diversify its economy. Our university has identified artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, preventing and treating addiction, and, uh, and uh, caring for an ongoing and aging population among areas with great growth potential in West Virginia and beyond. West Virginia's natural beauty, that is such a beautiful state, also can help us to attract the growing number of young professionals who are working remotely. Amid the pandemic, many are seizing the opportunity to work remotely from their jobs in big cities while living in areas that are less costly and crowded. The cost of living in West Virginia is 16% below the national average. About 4 million Americans are working remotely right now, and many states are, com are uh, competing to become their home base. Brad Smith, the executive uh, chairman of Intuit's board of directors, believes in West Virginia's appeal so strongly that he and his wife, Elise, donated $25 million to create the Brad and Elise Smith Outdoor Economic Development Collaboration. This resulting remote worker program, Ascend West Virginia, leverages our outdoor assets to bring fresh talent to this beautiful state. We, cho we chose three initial sites for the remote worker program, Morgantown, Shepherdstown, and Lewisburg. When the first application window opened for Morgantown, we received more than 7,500 applications for the 50 available spots. Strong interest in this program has caused us to expand from three to five sites. Recently, again, I met a couple who are among the, uh, the Morgantown cohort. The husband is a data scientist and West Virginia native, and the wife is a data engineer, by the way, from California. They both will be continuing to work for their Silicon Valley firms while enjoying the life and opportunity in West Virginia. This real life example reflects how, as a society, we have begun to examine our lives, our contributions, 
and our desire for work-life balance. At West Virginia University, we are in the midst of our own reflection. Education, healthcare, and prosperity have been our three pillars, but the pandemic has revealed another pillar that provides additional strength for all of our pursuits. That fourth pillar is purpose. I'm going to underline that again. That fourth pillar is purpose. You've heard me speak many times about the power of purpose and how it can transform your life. Today, a few of our colleagues share their stories of purpose with us. I'm going to turn now to our video. Every day I wake up, I think, how am I going to make the world better? Maybe one to two people a day, how am I going to be able to impact someone's day? <laughs> My DNA comes directly from these mountains and the people who helped raise me, so there's a little bit of responsibility that I feel uh, with that. My purpose is making sure that I give back to my state, my university, my department, and the students that occupy West Virginia University. If you ask anyone with kids about their purpose, they would tell you that guiding their children, seeing to it that their children have a better life, and that they find their purpose is paramount. I have been blessed to be able to have that same kind of purpose in my educational experience with the students, helping them find their purpose. My purpose here at WVU is to perform research in brain disorders that will help our state, our nation, and the world around us. And secondly, to train students in order to be wonderful researchers and then to pass this knowledge onto them so that they train others. The main purpose for me, I think, is just making the students feel comfortable, feel safe, and make WVU feel like their home. Especially our military veteran students, they've signed up to serve the country, um, and that comes with a big price tag sometimes. I've just seen so many entrepreneurs and inventors that really have the state's like best interest at heart, and I think that's really, like being able to collaborate with them has really become one of my passions. I want to be able to show for instance, the student from small town West Virginia or small town anywhere to bring these students to a different country. There are just so many different cultures and walks of life and, and different types of families and how they've been raised and their experiences. And every experience is different. If everybody can kind of see that and realize that, I think there's gonna be a lot more unity. And I think it's all a collaborative effort where no one's an island. We're none gonna solve anything by ourselves. And, uh, but together, I think we can make a big difference. We have to pay attention to how we feel about the work we're doing. We have to ask ourselves what gets us up every day. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, what do you want to leave behind? Beautifully done. So what do you want to leave behind? Frankie Tack, who's here with us today, sums it up beautifully. What do we want to leave behind? So as president, uh, I've thought about this a lot. I want to leave behind a university that encourages people to pursue their passions and their purpose. I also want to leave behind a university that provides the opportunities to use that purpose to do good in this world. Therefore, we must pursue education, health care, and prosperity with a renewed and focused determination to transform West Virginia University into a purpose-driven leader in higher education. Let me just say that again. West Virginia University must become a purpose-driven leader in higher education. At a time when resources are so limited, needs are so great, expectations are so high, and threats are so significant, universities cannot afford complacency. That is why academic transformation led by Provost Mary Ann Reed recognizes that there is fundamental change occurring in higher education and that we need to lead with purpose rather than follow. The mantra for our academic transformation is improve quality while reducing costs. Through a data-driven process, all undergraduate and some graduate degree programs were reviewed to determine their relative health and prospects for future growth. 
College and department leaders provided additional information to inform the decision of whether to maintain, reconfigure, eliminate, or grow programs in our current academic portfolio. We will be working, of course, with the colleges to implement specific actions following the Board of Governors' approval this month. Later this week, the Provost's Office is hosting an Academic Innovation Summit in partnership with the Health Sciences and the Research Office. The event will bring together a carefully curated group of top faculty, researchers, academic leaders, and community members to generate ideas for new academic programming, research, and outreach to our state and region. The theme for the summit is Building Resilient Communities, and the hackathon-style challenges will be focused on five topics, economy, education, energy and sustainability, addiction and recovery, and healthy aging. Groups will pitch their proposals to a panel of judges who will determine seed funding for sustainable projects. The provost office and a committee of faculty and staff have also been actively identifying ways to improve student success from retention and persistence to graduation rates. We implemented an improved process for early student interventions and launched a comprehensive tutoring website. We completed the implementation of our new guided major pathway, ensuring students find the right academic home. And a committee of faculty led by the provost's office is reviewing our faculty evaluation, rewards, and recognition structure to re-envision how we reward and recognize faculty so that it is not a one-size-fits-all approach, but rather an equitable and transparent system designed to reward and recognize faculty who make a variety of contributions throughout the life of their careers here at our university. We also took bold action by merging the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences and the College of Education and Human Services to create a new college focused on human and youth development. This will unite the expertise of both colleges and promote new in-demand academic programs, interdisciplinary research, and efficient service to students. In the coming months, we will determine the identity, vision, and mission of this new college along with the name. We hope to launch a national search for the new college's founding dean in January. We are also transforming student life on campus by strengthening mental health resources, promoting diversity and inclusion, and invigorating the out-of-classroom experience. To increase access to mental health resources, we launched a partnership with Talkspace. Students in Morgantown, Ber uh, Beckley, Kaiser, and those taking classes online can now use the Talkspace app to text and chat with licensed therapists via um, private messaging and live videos from anywhere at no cost. The Cruise Center has scaled up in-person appointments and hired additional staff with an eye on diversity to support our students' changing needs. The center also kicked off a Let's Chat, a Let's Chat initiative uh, during Welcome Week, which provided easy access to informal consultations at different locations around campus where counselors can listen to student concerns. And Healthy Minds University launched this fall to work in partnership with the Crew Center and other university support services to offer outpatient psychiatric treatment and therapy services for students referred there. Now, Healthy Minds University, operated by WVU Medicine and WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, does not, let me just say, does not replace the services that the Crew Center offers, but instead, supplements and serves as an additional counseling resource for students. In addition, a group of 11 West Virginia University students came together for the inaugural Student Wellness and Mental Health Advisory Board. The board members serve as advocates for student-centered well-being and maintain liaisons with the Cruz Center, Well WVU, Campus Recreation, and others. Finally, we have created a website to house all mental health resources, allowing for quick access to information. Now, we all understand, and certainly I recognize, that faculty and staff are also experiencing stress, ang stress anxiety, uh, depression, 
and other mental health and wellness challenges at greater rates. So we have been intentional about sharing information with them about support and services available as the semester has gotten underway. We also continue to transform our university by investing in resources to combat racism and inequality on the campuses. We created a system-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion council that addresses and supports the needs of our campuses. We conducted a review of how diversity and equity work is valued in promotion and tenure decisions, and the newly created Faculty Justice Network offers an inviting space for racially minoritized faculty members to gather and address unique social, cultural, academic, and professional development needs and interests. There, uh, there and, uh, and these and other programs help us earn the Higher Education Excellence and Diversity Award for the sixth consecutive year. Another program I suspect will gain us national recognition will launch in January. Some of you may recall Project 168, which was introduced a few years ago. However, it never quite got off the ground as we had hoped. My question has always been, if you spend 18 hours in the classroom as a student, what are you doing with the other 150 hours in the week? Now, I'm delighted to say that today we can answer that question. Student life has created an innovative approach to add purpose to the students' experiences while bringing our core values to life. What a student learns outside the classroom is as important as what they learn inside the classroom. Project 168 is a way to formally recognize and provide rec record of extracurricular efforts. With the help of a coach, each student can create a self-paced co-curricular experience that will offer a minimum of 53 opportunities to engage in 10 content areas. But what truly makes uh, this unique is that there will be a formalized process with the university registrar as WVU engaged tracks participation. When requirements for each competency area have been met, students will receive a co-curricular transcript printed on official WVU transcript paper. This co-curricular transcript can be shared with potential employers and included in graduate and professional school applications. For those who complete this full curriculum, they will be invited to join a new honors organization, the 168 Society. And as we look to transform the student experience, we are ensuring that transformation is reaching every part of the Mountaineer family, including our passionate alumni base. The university will soon enter a new partnership agreement with the Alumni Association to enhance the alumni experience, increase opportunities for networking, build connections with students and young alumni, and foster a culture of inclusivity. So bringing all these transformative efforts together forges a powerful sense of purpose. And I want to ensure uh, that every student, faculty, and staff member is committed to our overall purpose, as well as being supported in the pursuits of their own. To make that happen, we are establishing the first Purpose Institute ever located on a university campus. We first met Courtney Spence a few years ago in Austin, Texas. She is the founder and CEO of the Spence Group, a global strategic consulting and creative group. Courtney and her team work every day to guide people and organizations to discover and live their purpose. And I'm pleased to welcome Courtney and her team to our campus today. Courtney and team, will you please stand up? Come on, everyone stand up here, okay? Give them a round of applause, would you please? You'll get a chance to see more of them, I can assure you. But we are entering into a partnership with the Spence Group that will reinforce our Mountaineer values and our core brand. It will help us create a stated purpose that will motivate each of us every day and remind us why we are here. And the reality is, our university is already filled with purpose. We heard from just a few of our colleagues uh, who, led, who have led purposeful lives. I feel it every day when I wake up and step onto our campus. We do our work just not for ourselves, but for others. That is different than other institutions, and I should know. Having that sense of purpose is special. 
Now is our time to fully embrace that feeling and turn it into action. On our campus, we plan to have a physical center focused on purpose. This center will help uh, prospective students and employees as well as current students, faculty, staff, and alumni discover or rediscover their purpose and place in the world and then help them chart that path forward. While we are in the beginning stages, this initiative will bring together many facets of the university to elevate education, wellness, and service to our campus and our community, all with the sense of positive intent. So we are grateful to Courtney and her team for sharing this expertise. So in conclusion, and that's always a wonderful word, isn't it? Um, West Virginia University has been on a transformational journey not only during the past 19 months of the pandemic, but for the past eight years. We have celebrated the diversity that unites us as one WVU across the campus system. We introduced the Mountaineers Go First campaign and a new brand platform to share the pioneering work we do here and the successful lives we launch. Through initiatives such as shared services and the hub we have made the processes supporting our students in our work more efficient and effective. We have made striking improvements to our facilities and grounds, most re recently watching Reynolds Hall arise to become a cutting edge home for the Chambers College of Business and Economics next year. And I might just note as I came in, take a look when you leave at that beautiful new children's hospital that is nearing completion. We created a humanities center to promote and support inquiry into issues that affect our daily lives and creative endeavors that feed our souls. We have expanded WVU Medicine to include more than 20,000 employees, almost 3,000 providers, and 22 hospitals, putting world-class treatment close to home for each and every West Virginian. We have nurtured relationships with donors who believe in our work, with the WVU Foundation receiving a record $270 million in gifts and pledges in fiscal year 2021, despite economic upheaval caused by the pandemic. We launched West Virginia Forward, which has created entrepreneurial and economic opportunities that has improved our university and our state as well. We have raised funds to create modern forward-thinking athletic facilities that help us recruit, retain, and nurture our student athletes. We have forged important community partnerships and recently unveiled a new Center for Community Engagement led by Extension that focuses on academic opportunities that bring faculty, staff, and partners together to address the most pressing issues facing those communities. Clearly, transforming is not a new concept to us. We have done more transforming than Optimus Prime. Transforming with renewed purpose is the next logical step. A deliberate movement toward improving higher education, improving health care, and improving lives in West Virginia and beyond. We have come far, we have ground yet to cover, and we will do so with purpose, with pride, and with our forever rallying cry of let's go, Mountaineers. And now, of course, I invite uh, Mary Ann Reed, our provost, and Corey Ferris, our dean of students, to join me as we turn to questions and answers session moderated by April Call, um, executive director of communications and university relations. So April, I turn it over to you, okay? Thank you very much, President Gee. Appreciate that. And I just want to note that we have a number of people who are watching online as we are doing a live stream of today's address and event. So we welcome all of you joining us online as well as those here in the room with us. And President Gee, I'm going to start with a question for you uh, and just note for everyone here in the room, if you do have a question, just raise up your hand. We have a couple of people with microphones and we will get a microphone to you. So if you have a question, just raise up your hand, I'll be watching, we can get to you uh, as quickly as possible. So to start things off, I want to know a little more about the Purpose Institute. Specifically, what is, what is it going to mean for our university within the landscape of higher education, but more specifically, what do you believe it will mean for faculty, staff, students, and others 
right here on our campus. Well, you know, I, uh, and, and of course, Courtney and team are here, and they will have a chance to talk with a number of people about this, but this is a, a conjoint project, something that we have thought about for a long time, something that Sharon Martin has been very much a driving force, that Clay Marsh, wherever Dr. Marsh is, uh, has been very involved in. Um, and the reason is this, is we, is one of the things that I discovered on returning to, to this university is that there's something in the water there's something very precise about this place. It's that grit that I think uh, has made us a much different place. And a lot of it is the fact that uh, we have always felt that we've had a purpose that goes beyond ourselves. Of course, we're a land-grant university. And by the very nature of being a land-grant university, we have, uh, we have the responsibility to be a people's university. But I believe that uh, what we've done in higher education, we've driven ourselves much toward rankings and ratings and not toward what is really that which establishes a, a, a great university, and that is having a place that really does uh, make a difference in people's lives. Uh, some of you have heard me say this, but I'll say it again. I often point out that uh, when we're recruiting people, I tell people, if you want to come here, um, just for uh, ratings or rankings or for prestige, then please do not come. You'll be unhappy. But if you want to come here uh, because you have a purpose in life and you want to make a difference, then there will be no better place to come. And I that is really what the Purpose Institute is going to be about. I know your answer to this is probably going to be yesterday, but I'm going to ask anyway. Do you have a timeline on when we'll start to see the fruits of the Purpose Institute here on our campus and where the physical location is going to be for us? Well, uh, I think that we're still determining that. That's one of the reasons that Courtney and team are here, but, but we're moving very swiftly, and we hope to have something up and running uh, very soon. And we do want to have a physical space. We want, in fact, uh, we're looking at physical space in the Crossings Building because we want to have a place where everyone can come and uh, find a central uh, core uh, opportunity to be able to uh, engage with each other. Let me shift gears just a little bit and bring Provost Reed into the conversation, turning our attention to academic transformation. President Gee, you said today that the mantra for our academic transformation is improve quality while reducing costs. So what do you mean by that, especially for those who perhaps are concerned that this is really an effort to cut programs and faculty as opposed to looking yeah. forward to the future of what higher education and the landscape is well, going to be. Well, I know the provost will want to talk about this, but I, I do become irrationally irritated when people say, well, this is about money. It's not. It's about the fact that we've entered into a very fast forward world. Uh, you know, I point out when Christopher, uh, you know, when when America was discovered, Christopher Columbus landed on these shores to the, to the year 1900, knowledge doubled once. Now knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. And any university that believes that it can remain static is an institution that is in decline. And so what this is about, this is about constantly improving quality and, and finding the resources to be able to invent, uh, invest in, that, in those new uh, ideas. And that does not mean to say that everything we do is always perfect. It doesn't mean to say that this process is perfect. What it does mean to say is the fact that we all know that there are things that no longer work and there are things that are no longer relevant and we need to constantly uh, make the leap to, to move ourselves forward rather than simply looking through the rear view mirror all the time. Madam Provost, you wanna to add to that? Absolutely, I would just add that that this process is about the future. It's really about positioning the university to be successful now and into the future in a very challenging higher education environment, um, in a resource con constrained environment. So how do we identify those new areas of growth and opportunity and find the resources to support them? Ultimately, we're only going to be successful if we grow. Uh, but in order to grow, we have to do some recalibration of where we're gonna put our energy and where we're gonna put our limited resources. And that's what this whole process is about. It's about identifying efficiencies, but more importantly, identifying opportunities so that we can channel resources to those new growth areas. And Corey, to the president's point earlier about academic transformation being part of an overarching uh, approach to rethinking everything that happens on campus, Talk a little bit about 
some of the changes that have happened in the area of student life, the student experience, and, and what we might anticipate seeing as we move forward, specifically related to Project 168, mental health, and other uh, initiatives across campus. Well, thanks, April. You know, we've heard the president say time and again, and I'll take the words from you, that we're in the midst of two pandemics, you know, the pandemic of the virus and the pandemic of mental health. And, and um, the needs of our students have grown. Um, and so we've adapted and changed and added resources so our students can access, access them 24 hours a day and, and wherever they are in the world. You mentioned uh, Talkspace, a crisis text line, plus our own grief counselors are available uh, 24 seven um, when there's a crisis. Um, but the other piece is that, is that Project 168. You know, we've, we heard from employers um, that our students were, were very well prepared academically, but they also wanted to ensure, um, wanted, us, wanted, wanted to ensure that the students could be prepared in, I'll say, the soft skills. And so through Project 168, we'll be able to offer them opportunities um, that will change from year to year that our academic partners or others across campus will be offering or speakers that come to campus or experiences be able to count those and record those so they will be on that transcript that the president described so the students can officially, I'll say, demonstrate to that employer or to that graduate school that they've got some great experiences uh, uh, through their four years at WVU. I'm gonna call a little bit of an audible and call on Rob Alsop, our Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, because as part of transformation, that process actually began a number of years ago, and, and the areas, Rob, that, that you helped to oversee at the institution really were some of the initial adopters of some of these same sorts of, of policies and approaches that we've seen. So I was hopeful that, that maybe you could talk just a little bit about some of the areas uh, within your uh, purview that have seen changes in recent years. Sure, um, happy to do so. So, you know, several years ago, 2014, 2015, um, we talked internally about whether we could get additional money from the legislature. And we quickly realized that the answer to that was likely no. And so the first one of the things we did is, well, if you can't give us money, give us freedom. Um, and so we worked hard 2015-2016 session to um, have the ability from a human resource and a talent and culture perspective uh, to really modernize what we do as far as um, everywhere thing from recruiting to retaining to the process of making sure that our um, we reward those who do really well that our employees are accountable and that we look like the rest of the world and so we did a tremendous amount there another area of transformation I see here in the audience is you know we had an opportunity with Beckley when Mountain State um, lost its accreditation. And so um, we worked together and said, this is a terrific, terrific opportunity to provide a future for WVU Tech. Um, going into Montgomery and saying we're gonna move was not easy, but the transformation and the opportunities for those students I think is gonna live on for um, a long time. A Couple of other, just real quickly, uh, I think the move was shared services while any process like that where you're moving a lot of folks and, and centralizing can be tough. Um, we know a lot more, we're much more efficient um, in serving the institution better uh, moving forward. And then we've done some things like dining and others that, um, again, while bumpy, as you look at the long term of the institution and the upgrades to dining at Towers and Hatfields and what we've done when able to be quickly move things in, um, it's not that we've done everything right, but it's we've made the determination that we need to move quickly to respond and provide the best environment we can for our faculty, our staff, and our students. Rob, thank you very much. And President Gee, in listening to all of this so far we've talked about, it strikes me that there's a lot being balanced. As a land-grant institution, I have heard you often speak about our responsibility to the state and to its people. And the pillars of healthcare, prosperity, education, and now purpose are directly intertwined with that mission. How do you see balancing that mission with the parallel responsibilities of building a campus community that is robust 
and vibrant and forward thinking for our students, faculty, staff, and visitors. Yeah, you, you know, um, of course I've been president of a couple of institutions which were really very inward focused. I point out that, um, and, and this is not meant to be negative, I don't want my colleagues in Providence to think that, but when I, when I became the president of Brown, at my public announcement, I said, I think it'd be great to have a, have a wonderful Ivy League institution uh, have a public purpose, and I nearly got ridden out of town right then because it was not that was not what they believed, and they believed that it was very much about about uh, their own uh, their own well-being in the in the sense of uh, growing that institution. Um, Abraham Lincoln established this university. Many of you have heard me say this. Uh, he established this university with the very clear intent that what we're going to do is make a difference in the lives of every individual. One of the things I alluded to here today was the, uh, was the young man, the young man who, uh, who had received uh, the, the deep brain stimulation, who is now two years uh, free of opioid addiction. Now, what could have happened, and, and they, I know that they've done it, uh, the, the doctor resigned his team, but R and I have written this up and it's published in a number of journals, but a lot of places they'll write it up, it'll be published in Lancet or it'll be published in, uh, in New England Journal of Medicine and everyone celebrates and they go and talk about it in a, variety of, uh, in a variety of settings. Our goal as an institution is to discover the cure for cancer and make certain that people of McDowell County have access to it. And that is, I think, the difference of what we're trying to do right now. So that's the robustness of what we're about. We're about being, first of all, a, a, a university of ideas and of creativity. But we're about being a university of ideas and creativity that makes certain that everyone comes along with us with hope and resiliency. As we wrap things up uh, for our Q&A, this has certainly been a period in our history where, as you noted, it has been often divisive. It's been uncertain. It's been challenging. What is your view of the near future? Are you optimistic? Well, I, I'm, I'm not only optimistic, I really do believe that the university is the driving force for the, for the nation. Uh, you know, um, we've moved from a hardware to a thoughtware society, April. By that I mean, uh, when I first became a president of this institution, coal was king. Uh, steel was belching out of uh, those big, uh, those big uh, uh, um, All the stacks, stacks and everything in, in, in Pittsburgh, you know, and uh, that was the future. And now I, I'm here uh, some uh, 40 plus years later, and all of those are gone. Uh, coal still does have, uh, and energy still has some resiliency, obviously, but, but, but the world has changed, and now the future of our nation is based upon our ability to outthink and outperform. There are only 330 million uh, uh, people in this country. There are 1.4 billion Chinese or 1.4 billion Indians. Uh, just on the basis of scale, we lose. So now universities become that economic engine. The thing that the thing that I will say is uh, that that is of concern to me is the fact that universities need to return to being universities. And by that, I believe that we need to be places of ideas. We need to welcome all the ideas, good ideas, bad ideas, irritating ideas, irrational ideas, obnoxious ideas. And the marketplace needs to prevail. I think that some of our colleagues have started to engineer the notion of ideas. And anyone that, anytime you start preventing uh, common conversations, open conversations, robust conversations, you lose your right to call yourself a university. So I'm very optimistic, but I do believe that we need to hold to that very high gold standard, which is that uh, we're a place of ideas. Well, thank you for joining in our conversation today. Provost Reed, Dean Ferris, as well as Vice President Alsop, appreciate your input as well today. Thanks to all watching online. I'm going to turn things back over to Ashley for the remainder of the Faculty Senate meeting. Have a great afternoon, stay well. Thank you, President Gee. President Gee's address was the only item for the 2021 Faculty Assembly meeting. So given that there is any, is there any objection to adjourning the Faculty Assembly? 
Hearing none, the 2021 meeting of the Faculty Assembly is adjourned. We will reconvene in about 15 minutes to call the regular, regular Faculty Senate meeting to order. Please note that there is a different link to the Faculty Senate meeting if you are attending remotely. If you are here in person, if faculty senators could sit on the left-hand side and the rest of our community sit on the right-hand side, that will help in counting votes. Thank you.